to my YouTube channel. I'm so excited. Welcome back to our Single and Satisfied monthly study and we are on part five. So I'm really pumped up to kind of just get into it. Um, today's study is going to be out of the book of Esther. And so Esther had a heart of the king and there's a lot of things that Esther did that really helped her to obtain the favor of God. They really put her in the right place at the right time. They really catapulted her into her destiny, into her purpose, into her promise that God had for her that she didn't even know God had for her. So I'd first like to start, before I jump too far and deep into it, start with prayer. Lord, I just thank you for this monthly study, Lord God. I just thank you that each and every woman that's tuning in, you know their hearts. Lord, you know what they're dealing with. You know what their struggles are right now. You know, Lord God, the attacks of the enemy that they're facing, the trials, the temptation, Lord God. Everything that they need, you have, Lord. You are the answer. Lord, be their strength, Lord God. Be their comfort. Be their guide, Lord God. And just continue to shower them and cover them with your love and with your peace. In your mighty name, I pray, Jesus. Amen. All right. So I am going to first start by reading from the book of Esther. And I'm reading from the NLT version, New Living Translation. And I'm going to start at the King's Banquet. I'm going to start at verse 1, Esther 1 and 1. So, these events happened in a day of King Xerxes, who reigned over 127 provinces, stretching from India to Ethiopia. At that time, Xerxes ruled his empire from his royal throne at the fortress of Susa. In the third year of his reign, he gave a banquet for all his nobles and officials. He invited all the military officers of Persia and Media, as well as the princes and nobles of the provinces. The celebration lasted 180 days, a tremendous display of the opulent wealth of his empire and the pomp and splendor of his majesty. So just from reading that, you know that he was a great king, that his um, kingdom was elaborate. It just says it in his word right here that it was opulent. It, he showed the greatness of his majesty and he kind of wanted to share that with the citizens and to show that to everyone. When it was all over, the king gave a banquet for all the people from greatest to least who were in the fortress in Susa. It lasted for seven days and was held in the courtyard of the palace garden. The courtyard was beautifully decorated with white cotton curtains and blue hangings, with, which were fastened with white linen cords and purple ribbons to silver rings embedded in marble pillars. Gold and silver couches stood on a mosaic pavement of porphyry, marble, mother of pearl, and other costly stones. So this sounds like an amazing event, an amazing kingdom, just beautiful sight to see. At the same time, Queen Vashti gave a banquet for the women in the royal palace of King Xerxes. And so just to go down a little bit further, I'm not going to read all of this, but the king wanted Queen Vashti to come before all of the men in his banquet. Again, as it says, she was holding her separate banquet for all of the women. And he wanted to display her beauty. Well, she refused. And because of this, of course, that made the king look bad and he was angry. And so he asked his officials, what should I do? He thought about it. You know, this is embarrassing. I'm the king. She refuses to come before my subjects. How would this affect their respect of me? And it goes down to even say, you know what? If the queen can get away with this behavior, it's disrespecting the king, and I don't do anything, this kind of behavior is going to go across the land, and all women are going to think that it's okay to disrespect and act any type of way towards their husbands. So the officials told him, I'll make a royal edict that Queen Vashti can no longer come before you as the queen. So in other words, she's vanished from the kingdom. She's no longer queen. She's no longer his wife. And your choice now is to choose someone who is more suitable in your eyes to be queen. And so what they did is they made sure that all of the virgins in the land were rounded up and they were forced to come to the kingdom in order that the king can choose a bride for himself, a queen who he thought was more suitable than Queen Vashti. And so imagine this, if you're a young woman back in those days and you hear of this, wow, there's an opportunity to be queen, you know, we get to go to the, the kingdom. Some people think, wow, that's awesome, I'll be excited, it's like a, a competition or it's like a pageant and I want to win, I want to be queen. How awesome would that be to come just from a regular life to becoming a queen of the nation? But you have to think of it like this as well. I would kind of wonder, wow. That may sound great, but if he, the king kicked out Queen Vashti, banished her, what kind of king is this? So I might would actually be scared, especially if you're ripped from your homes with no notice or short notice from your families and just rushed into the palace. 
even though some women may have been excited this opportunity to, to live in the kingdom to meet the king maybe i'll be chosen and some women might actually have been scared or freaked out like I don't know what this is going to look like. Maybe it'll be a great time. Maybe this will be a horrible time, but it's unpredictable. It's the unknown. It could be scary yet exciting or maybe both. And so this is just something to keep in mind. And so this is what happened. So I'm going to go on to Esther 2. After Xerxes' anger had subsided, he began thinking about Vashti and what she had done and decree he had made. So his personal attendant suggested, let us search the empire to find beautiful young virgins for the king. So that's the part where I said he was looking for other virgins to bring into the kingdom. Let the king appoint agents in each province to bring these beautiful young women into the royal harem at the fortress of Susa. Haggai, the king's eunuch in charge of the harem, will see that they all are given beauty treatments. After that, the young women who most pleases the king will be made queen instead of Vashti. So the young woman that he chooses. This advice, it was appealing to the king. As I said, that's exactly what he did. Um, so he put the plan into effect. And at that time, there was a Jewish man in the fortress of Susa whose name was Mordecai, son of Jair. He was from the tribe of Benjamin and was a descendant of Kish and Shimea. His family had been among those who, with King Jehoiachin of Judah, had been exiled from Jerusalem to Babylon by, Babylon by King Nebuchadnezzar. Now this man had a very beautiful and lovely young cousin, Hadassah, who was also called Esther. When her family and mother died, Mordecai adopted her into his family and raised her as his own daughter. As a result of the king's decree, Esther along with many other women were brought to the king's harem at the fortress of Susa and placed in Haggai's care. Haggai was very impressed with Esther and treated her kindly. He quickly ordered a special menu for her and provided her with beauty treatments. He also assigned her seven maids specially chosen from the king's palace and he moved her and her maids into the best place in the harem. Esther had not told anyone of her nationality and family background because Mordecai had directed her not to do so again because she was Jewish. Every day Mordecai would take a walk near the courtyard of the harem to find out about Esther and what was happening to her. Before each woman was taken to the king's bed, she was given the prescribed 12 months of beauty treatments, six months with oil of myrrh, followed by six months with special perfumes and ointments. When it was told for her to go to the king's palace, she was given her choice of whatever clothing or jewelry she wanted to take from the harem. That evening, she was taken to the king's private rooms, and the next morning, she was brought to the second harem, where the king's wives lived. There, she would be under the care of Shagash, the king's eunuch in charge of the concubines. She would never go to the king again unless he has especially enjoyed her and requested her by name. And so, let me just kind of go on to say, if you've heard the story, or if not, um, the king delighted in Queen Esther. Well, she wasn't queen yet. So if you know the story, or you don't know the story, um, the king Xerxes, he found pleasure in Esther and so she was chosen to be queen and so first I kind of just want to stop there for a second she was chosen to be queen she was an orphan mind you as I said her parents died and then her uncle took care of her from that point on he adopted her but could you imagine your parents dying at a young age you don't know a lot about them you don't have a lot of memory so she may have grown up with you know, some pain or some remorse or some sadness about her parents. I'm sure her uncle Mordecai was great to her because it says he was honorable, he was respected in the land. But I'm sure she dealt with some insecurities, maybe feeling rejected or like, you know, just dealing with some of those things. God, why did this have to happen to me? Why am I an orphan? So she might have struggled in some ways in her life. She might have had some struggles and some obstacles and some feelings and some emotions that she didn't know how to deal with. But yet, she still was able to become queen and to turn things around and to have a great future a, to fulfill her purpose, her destiny. And my question is this, Esther, even as an orphan or even as the woman that she was, I'm assuming compared to a queen, probably lived like a pauper. She had the heart of a queen. And let me ask you this, do you have the heart of a queen? Because if we can think about some of the things that she went through, being snatched from her uncle after her parents had been already taken away from her, going into the unknown. I'm sure she was freaked out, scared, and at times felt lonely. And even if she was excited about the thought of possibly becoming queen, all kind of conflicting thoughts could have been bombarding her. But yet she found favor 
as I read the story, it let us know that she obtained favor from the eunuch, the king's eunuch, who gave her handmaiden servants, he gave her extra beauty treatments, he gave her preferential treatment. And here's the thing, even when we're going through the unknown, the uncertain, the unthinkable, or our trials, our temptations, our tribulations, walking through a time in our life that's just so difficult, just so hard, just so dark, and we don't know how it's going to end up. Will you maintain the integrity of who God called you to be? Will you continue to serve him? Will you continue to live in a life of righteousness where that you can obtain the favor of the Lord? Because so many times in life, we're going to deal with the unknown. We're going to deal with situations that might be exciting, but we don't really know. We're doubting, we're fearing, we're scared, we're freaked out, um, we're hurt, we're in pain. It's just, we don't know how this is going to turn out for us. And sometimes we might start to sin or start to turn away from God or start to doubt God or start to talk negative about our God. And we don't maintain the integrity of who we are, of the queens that God has called us to be inwardly, of the children of the Most High God, of daughters of Christ. We have to maintain that integrity, maintain our faith in the Word of God and, and in the integrity of God's intentions towards us to know that He doesn't change when our circumstances change. He doesn't change when we don't understand what's going on in our life because He understands exactly the big picture of everything. So we have to maintain that integrity. So my question to you, do you have the heart of a queen? Are you living in a way where your life attracts the favor of God? Because the word lets us know that when your ways please God, he will cause men to favor you. You will find favor in the eyes of God and in the eyes of man. And Esther stood out. And I believe that that is a testament to the fact that she lived for God. And that she continued the integrity in her heart of who she knew God to be. And that doesn't mean that you don't sometimes find yourself in a place of fear or doubt, but you have to snatch those negative thoughts and say, you know what? I know that God is faithful and I know that God will never leave me or forsake me. And I know that the integrity of my God's heart towards me is good and that God is good and that he doesn't always cause negative things to happen, but he can use those for his glory to shape us, to make us and to bless us. Because this dark time of her being snatched from her uncle and all these women being snatched from their families, if chosen by the king, that tragedy or time of uncertainty can definitely catapult them into a life of wealth, prosperity, peace, honor, being the queen of the nation. So what situation are you in right now that it's uncertain? You don't know how it's going to end up. You almost even question, Lord, have you forsaken me? Have you forgotten about me? Seems like everyone's advancing but me. But he hasn't forgotten about you. Maintain that integrity in your heart and trust him because right now, whatever you're going through, it could be that very thing that's going to catapult you into that promise and into your purpose. And that's exactly what this did. It catapulted Esther into her promise and to her purpose. And I'm going to explain that a little bit more in detail a little bit later. And so... Because I believe Esther had a heart of righteousness, she had a life of holiness, living according to God's laws at that time and not forsaking God because of the situation of uncertainty that she was in at the time, I believe that's exactly why she obtained favor in the kingdom. King Xerxes or the eunuch, they didn't know Esther from anybody else in there, but God showed her favor. And that's what we want to do. We want to live a life so pleasing to God that we can't help but attract the favor of God because we're in a right standing with him and his light is shining upon us and we stand out and we don't look or act or talk like everyone else. So again, she obtained favor from the eunuch, the king's eunuch. And also, she sought wise counsel. And so when I read in the scripture in Esther 2, she was able to choose whatever she wanted to wear, whatever gowns or jewels or I'm sure diamonds, um, embellishments that she wanted to wear with her one night with the king. But she had wisdom. And I love this. It's almost like she said, it doesn't matter what pleases me. It matters what pleases the king. How am I supposed to know what pleases the king? And so she asked the king's eunuch, can you show me? Give me wisdom. And so she did exactly that. And he did exactly that. And I just love that. That's just so wise to me because I could only imagine 
going in the king's treasury or the great room with all of these clothes and all of these embellishments and I'm thinking in my mind I'd probably go crazy like oh my god look at those diamonds those emeralds those rubies look at those sparkly shoes like I, you know most of us we have everything we have more than what they told us we could even get you know but I love that she wasn't moved by all of that she said no 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 show me what will please the king give me wisdom because that is what I need to go forth and I love that so many times when things around us they glitter they look like gold it looks greener on the other side you know it's always like that the grass looks greener on the other side how many times do we stop and say Lord this looks like a good thing it even seems like a godly thing but is this you Lord is this God ordained for me this opportunity whatever it might be this relationship is this God ordained for me because it can look glittery it can shine and sparkle like gold and diamonds but underneath that it could be all smoke and mirrors just the enemy trying to deceive me so do you stop and ask God for wisdom or do you get distracted by the glitz and the glamour or by whatever temptation or whatever thing that just looks so glamorous to you or are you a woman of wisdom and you ask God because Proverbs tells us acknowledge God Proverbs 3 acknowledge God in all your ways he'll direct your path don't lean to your own understanding because we only see the natural God sees the spiritual he sees the eternal great picture we only see part of everything he's looking from a higher ground where he can see everything so he understands what you can't see that's hidden but we can't see everything so that's why it's so important to trust God I know I can't trust myself because myself will have me thrown off my feelings feelings are just so shallow they're so fake I mean they're real to you but feelings aren't wise you can't go by your feelings because they go up and down they shift so again she sought wise counsel and I believe that's why she was chosen as well she had the favor of God and it was his ordained will for her but she sought wise counsel now let's move on into the story because I would like to say that that was it she was chosen to be queen and that's the end of the story and that's just great it's a great love story but that's not all this is not just a story of love this is a story of actually selflessness and purpose her fulfilling her destiny all right so I want to move on I want to go to um, Esther I believe we're gonna move to Esther 3 so skipping down a little bit in the scripture Esther 3 talks about Haman's plot against the Jews and so I'm just gonna kind of go through the scripture a little bit and explain what's going on with that within the kingdom at this time so what you need to know now is Mordecai is Esther's uncle he is honorable in the land as a Jewish man he's noble and now his niece that he adopted is now queen she is now married to King Xerxes so that's what you need to know that's going on so verse 1 of Esther 3 sometime later King Xerxes promoted Haman all right and he was an Agagite over all of the other nobles making him the most powerful official in the empire all the king's officials would bow down before Haman to show him respect whenever he passed by for so the king had commanded but Mordecai refused to bow down or show him respect then the palace officials at the king's gate asked Mordecai, why are you disobeying the king's command? They spoke to him day after day, but he still refused to comply with the order. So they spoke to Haman about this to see if he would tolerate Mordecai's conduct since Mordecai had told them that he was a Jew. When Haman saw that Mordecai would not bow down or show him respect, he was filled with rage. He had learned of Mordecai's nationality. So he decided it was not enough to just lay hands on Mordecai alone. Instead, he looked for a way to destroy all Jews throughout the entire empire of Xerxes. So in the month of April, during the 12th year of King Xerxes' reign, lots were cast in Haman's presence to determine the best day and month to take action. And the day selected was March 7th, nearly a year later. So Haman approached the king. And he basically told him, there's a certain race of people scattered through all the provinces of your empire who keep themselves separate from everyone else. Their laws are different from those of any people and they refuse to obey the laws of the king. So it is not in the king's interest to let them live. If it pleases the king, issue a decree that they may be destroyed. And I will give 10,000 large sacks of silver to the government administrators to be deposited in the royal treasury. The king agreed confirming his decision by moving his signet ring from his finger and giving it to Haman, the Agagite, the enemy of the Jews. The king said, the money and the people are both yours to do with as you see fit. So on April 7th, the king's secretaries were summoned and the decree was written exactly as Haman dictated. So it was sent to the highest 
officers, the governors of the respective provinces and the nobles of each province in their own scripts and languages, the decree was written in the name of King Xerxes and sealed with the king's signet ring. So dispatches were sent out, um, messages were sent out to kill, slaughter, and annihilate all of the Jews, young and old, including women and children, in one single day. All right, and it was set to be on March 7th of the next year. So this decree was sent out in the land. Now think about it. It's to kill all of the Jewish people. <laughs> and because of pretty much Haman's selfish interest, he wants to kill an entire race of people. And the king goes for it because Haman, of course, like the enemy, he set up this huge case against them. They're separate. They don't obey your laws. They're a separate race of people. Because really, they didn't obey their laws. Um, Susa was a pagan nation, meaning they served other gods, not the most high God. Um, and so basically, yeah, they still live for God. And so they weren't living according to the pagan ways. They stay committed to their God and their Lord. And so he told them all of this, and this made the king feel, wow, well, they should be annihilated. Do as you please. But how do you feel once this decree goes out into all the land? Xerxes' wife, which he doesn't know, is a Jew, which he loves, because she never told or revealed her nationality or her race because her uncle Mordecai told her not to, probably because of, for her protection. And so how do you think she feels when she hears this and her uncle Mordecai feels and the people who know her, all the Jewish people in the land know now, wow, she's queen. Are you going to let this happen? You're the queen. You're married to the king. You have power in your hands. You can do something. Please help us. Please do something. And that's what Mordecai, as you go down in scripture, that's what he says. Please do something. Please help us. And I want to kind of go over that. And um, when Mordecai learned, I'm at Esther 4 and 1, when Mordecai learned about all that had been done, he tore his clothes put on burlap and ashes and went out into the city crying with a loud and bitter wail. So he ripped his clothes, he fell out, he cried, he, he was so sorrowful, he was so ripped up about it. And he went as far as the gate of the palace, for no one was allowed to enter the palace gate while wearing clothes or, of mourning. And as news of the king's decree reached all the provinces, there was a great mourning among the Jews. They fasted, they wept, they, they cried, they wailed, and many people lay in the burlap and ashes. When Queen Esther's maids and eunuchs came and told her about Mordecai, she was deeply distressed. She sent clothing to him to replace the burlap, but he refused it. Then Esther sent for Hatuk, one of the king's eunuchs, who had been appointed as her attendant. She ordered him to go to Mordecai and find out what was troubling him and why he was mourning. So Hatuk went out to Mordecai in the square in the front of the palace gate. Mordecai told him the whole story, including the exact amount of money Haman had promised to pay into the royal treasury for the destruction of the Jews. Mordecai gave Hatuk a copy of the decree issued in Susa that called for the death of all Jews. He asked Hatuk to show it to Esther and explain the situation to her. He also asked Hatuk to direct her to the king, to go to the king to beg for mercy and plead for her people. So Hatuk returned to Esther with Mordecai's message. Then Esther told Hatuk to go back and relay this message to Mordecai. All the king's officials and even the people in the provinces know that anyone who appears before the king in his inner court without being invited is doomed to die unless the king holds out his gold scepter. So basically, it was a death wish if she went to talk, go into court to talk to the king about anything unless he held out his gold scepter to her. And that was his choice. And no one but the king knows what he's going to choose to hold that out to and who he won't hold that out to because technically they were breaking the law but he could override it but that wasn't common and so just going on a little further and it said and the king has not called for me to come to him for 30 days so Hatuk gave Esther's message to Mordecai Mordecai sent this reply to Esther don't think for a moment that you're because you're in this palace you will escape when all other Jews are killed if you keep quiet at a time like this, deliverance and relief for the Jews will arise from some other place, but you and your relatives will die. Who knows if perhaps you were made queen for such a time as this? Wow, for such a time as this. Then Esther sent this reply to Mordecai, go and gather together all the Jews of Susan and fast for me. Do not eat or drink for three days, night or day. My maids and I will do the same. And then, though it is against the law, I will go in to see the king. If I must die, I must die. If I perish, I perish, basically. So Mordecai went away and did everything as Esther had ordered him. Wow. So this is kind of crazy, right? She knows it's against the law. 
the king has not summoned for her for 30 days. She knows that this is usually a death sentence. However, because of the instruction of Mordecai, she knows that right now she has a decision to either be selfish, to continue to lie about her nationality, and to be disobedient to God's call and purposes for her right now for being queen in the kingdom. Because as her uncle said, have you ever thought that you're a queen for such a time as this? That this is God's purpose, his will. He put you here for a reason. You are an orphan girl. You came from nothing to everything. God knew you before you were in your mother's womb. And, and so he's just telling her, you're here for a reason. You need to do what God is telling you to do. So she had to be selfless in this. And she told them, please fast and pray. We all fast and pray. Because it's the word says some things don't come out. Or some things you can't accomplish without fasting and prayer. Because you need the power of the Holy Spirit. You need the power of God to move through you. When this happened, the Jews fasted and prayed, the Jewish people. And Esther and her handmaidens also did the same. When time came for court, um, she actually went. And could you imagine? I would be so nervous. Imagine going before the king when you know this could be the last time that she will ever see the light of day. But you know what? That fasting and praying, that strengthened her. That strengthened her faith. It emptied her out from all that selfishness, um, from all the doubt, the fear, the anxiety, and it empowered her. It strengthened her in her most holy faith to know that God is the God in the impossible, that God is the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And I'm sure that they remembered that, and I'm sure that she had to continue to think of his law and his faithfulness and how he put her in that place of prestige for a purpose. And she had one or two choices. She could have been selfish and said, well, my husband doesn't even know. The king doesn't even know that I'm not that I'm Jewish. So he won't kill me. But God knew. And God would have revealed, I believe, revealed exactly who she was. And as Mordecai said, I believe that he prophesied to her, you will perish. I will perish. Your family, your relatives will perish. Because you did not choose up to be the savior that God called you to be. My question to you is, who's Esther? Are you? Because... Esther saved a nation. She saved an entire race of people. For such a time as this, what time is this for you? What people are looking to you to be their salvation, their example of Jesus Christ, their example of God on the earth? Because we're his children. We're his daughters. We're supposed to be shedding light and truth and hope to others. What young woman is looking to you in your singleness and you're the only example that she has of purity, of living right, of hope? of learning how to live single and be satisfied, of learning how to live single and not be desperate, of learning how to be single and not be sleeping around with everybody or sleeping around at all, but being single and waiting on God to sing your Boaz. What women? You're their lifeline. So whose Esther are you supposed to be? But because of your selfishness and it's all about you or your disobedience to what God is calling you to do in this time of your life or because you're your fear and doubt that you aren't equipped to do what God has called you to do, shame on you, God is the one that's going to equip you. He qualifies. Not us. It's nothing we could do, no matter how many degrees, whether you go to seminary school, or whether you are rich, whether you marry somebody rich, who your parents are. It doesn't matter. Those things don't qualify you for the work of God or whatever purposes he's called you to do. It's God who calls. It's God who justifies. It's God who qualifies. And it's God that's going to do the work in you. Not by power, not by might, but by my spirit, says the Lord. So if God is calling you to do something, do it. Be about it. But preceding your action needs to be fasting and praying. Because we need to hear the voice of the Lord. We need to hear his instruction. And he needs to prepare the way before us. There's a lot of things going on in the atmosphere, in the spiritual realm that we might not see naturally. But we need the prayer and the power of God to go before us to break it up and to destroy yokes and to tear down walls that are trying to stop us from meeting our purpose or going through that door of opportunity. And we need God to work on our heart that we're prepared, that we have the heart of a queen, that we're selfless like Queen Esther, that we go forth as God has called us to do, even if it doesn't seem to benefit us. That we can live a life of righteousness as Queen Esther, that we can obtain the favor of God and man. And also that we are able to have the strength and the ears to hear, to be obedient to the voice of God. Because I'm sure as she fasted and prayed, the voice resonated in her to say, Go forth, trust in me. I believe that God, all of who God is, encouraged her through her fasting and praying and encouraged the people. They were in unity in their fasting and praying. So it's so important for us to live a life of righteousness so that we can please God, but also so the favor of God can rest upon us. So also seek wise counsel. Counsel, we have the Holy Spirit. So seeking wise counsel, the Holy Spirit, and seeking wise counsel in his word, 
God's word and also in those that we trust not your friend, not those people around you that don't know as much word as you do or just know two scriptures or they know a bunch of scriptures but ain't living not one of it. Go to people you trust spiritually with your life, a spiritual mother or father or mentor. Hopefully that's your pastor or you have someone like that in your life that you can trust that lives the word of God, not just speaks it or not just preaches it, but is living it. You need to know their life. And also selfless devotion to God. Esther has selfless devotion to to God that selfless because some of us let's just keep it real some of us would have been like honey I'm a queen my man don't know that I'm a Jewish woman I'm good I am not about to go into that court and when I know that that's a death wish not doing it that's suicide not doing it how many of us would have been selfish you might say wow no I wouldn't want my whole entire race to die but it's the same concept, but God's telling you to do something and you refuse to. There's a whole generation of young women or men or young kids or whoever it might be, or business women or business leaders that are waiting for you or a community or a church or a school system that's waiting for you to step up and be their Esther. And you're letting them down because you're not living a life of righteousness. You're not living a life of wisdom. You're not living a life where you can hear the voice of God. You're not living a life where you're obeying the voice of God selflessly because we're worried about us. But how many of you know when you do what God has called you to do, even if it's something small like smile, give her a hug, she needs money, or say something nice to her even though she just got on your nerves, don't clap back, don't snap on her. Even when we do those little things, how we can bless somebody how we don't know if we were somebody's life that day. Somebody said, I'm going to kill myself if the next person doesn't smile. We just don't know. So that's why it's very important to listen to the voice of the Holy Spirit, to listen to God's voice, to have the heart of a queen. And then believe me, when you have the heart of a queen, you will live the life of a queen. And that's what's the beauty. I love the story of Esther because, as I said, it's a story of love. But it's also a story of purpose. And promise because of her life that she lived before the Lord because she was selfless not only did God favor her but choose her to be a queen but you know what also she was able to come to her promise and to fulfill her purpose so that road that was unpredictable that the enemy might have hoped been her demise or destruction led to her destiny her promise was her king her husband now come on how many of you would love to you know be royalty now in the natural we know we're spiritual royalty but to live with to marry somebody who's an actual king has a kingdom honey that, that's another level right but he brought her into contact with her king he set her in the right place at the right time the king didn't know who she was she didn't know nothing about anything about being a queen god did that so he brought it to her purpose of a kingdom to her king to honor and also fulfilling her purpose and her destiny which was to save her entire race can God trust you with such an assignment? Can he? Do you have the heart of a queen? Or do you need to check yourself? Because you have a heart of a pauper. And that's why you're not leading or God can't lead you to your promise because you don't have the correct mindset. So I just want to read some notes that I have. Esther's devotion to God and wisdom and selflessness led her through her trial and to her promise and purpose. It led her to her husband and king and a kingdom and honor, as I said. She saved a nation. When you honor God, God will honor you. He chose her. You know, I don't know how many other women were chosen, but think about it. In an entire nation or land, how many women, virgins, because back in those days, you know, you had to be a virgin for the most part. That was honorable. And if you weren't, that was seen as like horrible. And so how many women you think they actually put in the same situation as Esther? How many out of all those women, she was chosen? I'm thinking, I don't even know, I know hundreds, I don't know about thousands, but I'm thinking it had to be a lot of women in an entire kingdom. And so, as I asked you, are you someone's Esther? And I'm not talking about someone's queen as far as in the natural because we're single, you know, finding a mate. No, as I said earlier, you know what, well, when you honor God, God will honor you. He'll bless you. He'll send that husband for you that he has for you. But this is all about honoring God with our lives. This is all about loving him more than anything. It's about that selfless devotion to him that no matter what he asks of you, you're willing. Because you trust the integrity of God's heart towards you. And you know that whatever he does, even when it hurts, even when you don't understand, the ending's going to be great. Because he loves you. He loves you. And the bad things that we suffer, it's, it's going to strengthen us if we allow it going to mature us if we allow it but don't always think God causes everything that's negative some things are just life 
But even in those negative things, he can use those to shape you and to bless you. And not always just for you, to encourage someone else. Because again, we're not here just for ourselves. We're here to bless and help others along this journey of life as well. So, I hope this has encouraged you today. Um, I really, really, really just hope that you really understand what I'm trying to portray from the life of Esther. And my question is just, do you have a queen's heart? She obtained favor from the Lord because she lived a life of righteousness. And you might say, how do I live a life of righteousness? Well, first you have to accept Jesus Christ is your Lord and Savior to know that he died on the cross for you. He came into this imperfect world so that you can be perfect in him. So that you can have eternal life in heaven. So you don't have to live a life of sin. And his requirements is that you live according to his word, which is the Bible. And the Holy Spirit will lead you. He will help you through those things. And when you make mistakes, you ask God to forgive you and to help you. To strengthen you. But not to continue to just sin just because you know God has grace. Because God won't be mocked he knows your heart and he knows when you're using him or you're trying to think you're tricking him. He knows your thoughts and your intentions. So I would not try to, you know, try to trick the Lord. But again, accept God. The only way you can have God is through Jesus Christ, his son, because he died on the cross for you and rose again. And again, live according to his word. He wants us to live a life of purity, not because he wants to steal our joy, but because he wants to give us joy. He knows that when we live in ways that are sinful that we open the door for the enemy to invade our lives and our souls as we also cloud our mind and our ears we can't hear clearly the voice of God so are you in a situation where you've positioned yourself to live a life of righteousness so that you can obtain favor from the Lord and man and people do you seek wise counsel or are you impulsive and just do what you want to do because it looks good, it sounds good, and that's what your flesh or that human nature, selfish part of you wants or desires? Do you pray? Do you acknowledge God in all your ways? Do you fast when you have a very important situation or when you're struggling with a temptation? Do you really do what's necessary to be delivered, to hear the voice of the Lord, or to have direction, whether it's for whatever that thing that you want to do or feel that God is putting on your heart to do, you need God's direction. And you need God to go before you and to do some things in the spiritual realm that you can't do in the natural. Some yokes will only be destroyed through fasting. And are you obedient to the voice of the Lord once he gives you direction? Or do you make excuses? God, I can't do this. I won't do this. Because sometimes not that we can't, we won't, we refuse. Or you're selfish. I don't want to do this. It's no benefit to me. It's just a benefit to them. But again... Did God call you to be an Esther? For such a time as this, what is God calling you to do? For such a time as this. So again, also don't forget that a true queen has selfish devotion to God. She trusts in her God. She knows that her God is faithful. She knows that her God loves her and that he is her redeemer, her rescue, her guide, her comfort, her provider, the lover of her soul, her strength. Even when she's going through a dark valley and she knows not how she's going to get out. She trusts her God. So I want to close in prayer. Lord, touch every heart, every mind, every spirit, every longing, Lord God. Help us to recognize that you have called us to have a queen's heart. We're royalty. We're your daughters, God. Help us, Lord Jesus, to live a life of righteousness, Lord God, that we can be pleasing in your sight, Lord God, that we can position ourselves, Lord God, for your favor, Lord. Help us, Lord God. To have selfless devotion to you, no matter the situation. Lord God, touch our hearts to not have hearts of selfishness, Lord God. Lord, touch our hearts, Lord God, that we will be planted on your word, knowing that you love us, that you will never leave us or forsake us, Lord Jesus. Help us, Lord God, to seek wise counsel in your word, that we will ask the Holy Spirit before we act on anything to lead and to guide. And even if you lead us to talk to our spiritual leaders, that we will seek you, Lord, that we can hear your voice, that we will pray, that we will fast, Lord God. We will seek you with all our heart, with all our soul, with all our strength, Lord, knowing that a lot of things cannot be accomplished in our natural strength, Lord, but that we need the supernatural power of our God to break free and to break out and to tear down every demonic fortress that comes against us. So I thank you, Lord, for encouraging every heart. In your mighty name I pray, Lord Jesus, amen. 
all right ladies i hope you enjoyed um part five of continue to tune in every month on the first saturday of each month go ahead subscribe below if you um haven't already done so so that you don't miss any of the the videos or vlogs or the monthly studies also go to sharbria.com to check out my blogs and also join the single and satisfying movement there are other women who are single as well who are enjoying life enjoying god and just encouraging each other in our in our struggles in the times of loneliness in some times of uncertainties go ahead go to singleunsatisfied.com and join us so again i love you all go ahead and just enjoy the rest of your day god bless you bye